Father, we do want to stop this morning and we look to you. And Lord, we acknowledge once again that you are the giver of all good gifts. That all the blessings that we have, that the life and health and strength that we have today are from you. That Lord, we know we are here together because of you, because of your working in us and in our hearts and our circumstances to bring us together today. And Lord, we rejoice in knowing that you are sovereign over all things. And even as we look at the world around us, we do not have to fear that things are out of control, that things somehow will, will go wrong, but that you are in absolute control of all things, that you are accomplishing your good purposes. And so, Father, as we think of our nation and our world today, once again, we do pray that you will show your glory. Use these circumstances to draw men's eyes and hearts to you. And Father, we pray that men everywhere will repent and trust Christ for salvation. And Lord, we pray for this church that we will be faithful in proclaiming the gospel, that each one of us will individually be pointing others to Christ. That, God, you would give us that boldness to proclaim you faithfully, lovingly to those around us. And, Lord, we know there are many that we have been praying for, some for, for many years. We pray especially for those ones this morning, that they will humble themselves before you. Father, you will open their eyes that they may see their need of a Savior, and that they will trust you. And so we pray for the salvation of these souls. Lord, we pray for the work of this ministry, that we will lift you up, that we will truly glorify you, that it will be evident that you are most important, that we love you more than any other thing. That, Father, you will be doing a remarkable work in this church. Again, we thank you for how you've been at work. We pray that you'll continue that great work. Lord, we pray as, as well again today for those that are still unable to be with us. Father, we ask that you will encourage their hearts. Strengthen them as I know they desire to be here. But because of the various needs, they're not able to. And so I pray that you will minister to them today. That, Lord, they will be assured both of your presence and also of our love for them and our concern for them. And so, Father, in all of these many requests, we just lift them up to you, knowing that you are working your perfect will. Lord, we trust your goodness in all these things, and we ask today that you will be mightily at work in us through your word. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The came for, same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we do want to look to you today and ask your blessing on your word as we think of, once again, of Jesus. We know that he is the light of the world. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we may see him, that we may see him in his beauty and his glory this morning, that if any, again, are not saved, that they may come to you today for salvation, that we who are saved, that we will rejoice in the light and the life that is ours in Christ, that we will rejoice in the glory and the brilliance of Jesus. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. If you want to open your Bibles to John chapter 8 and verse 12, darkness and light, basic, familiar concepts to everyone. But we actually don't often see true darkness. You go outside at night, and the sky is lit up by the moon and the stars. If you live in town or in a bigger city, You go outside at night and the sky is lit up by gas stations and used car dealerships and other such things as that. You go in your house, you turn off all the lights in the house, and your rooms are lit up by a galaxy of electrical indicator lights. Your phone charger, your computer, your TV, your fridge, and practically every other appliance has a little light on it somewhere. If you've ever been in a cave, though, you've seen, or maybe you've seen, complete darkness. Even though we don't usually see complete, total darkness, light is something we see all the time. We think about it a lot, but we don't necessarily notice it, unless maybe we have to change a light bulb. And light is a marvelous creation. It's one of the fastest moving objects in the universe. The speed at which light travels is believed to be the maximum speed that anything in the universe can achieve. You know, light travels so quickly, it it covers over 186,000 miles every second. So that means if you traveled at the speed of light, you could make seven trips around the world in one second and actually still have some time to spare. Light produces all of the colors that we see around us. Light breaks down into the visible spectrum, and we see this every time we see a rainbow. You're seeing the light scattered to, into the visible spectrum. When light hits an object, certain colors are absorbed, other colors are reflected. So the green leaves and the green grass that we see outside, it's green because it absorbs the other colors and just reflects those that comprise green. We look in the sky and we see the blue sky. It's because it is reflecting back the blue colors. Black is a result of the absorption of all colors. White is the reflection of all the colors. And so light is that which makes life really more beautiful. And life is that which makes light, or light is that which makes life possible. It is, it's the process which drives the, and plants the transformation of carbon dioxide into energy and the various resources needed for the plant. It's the, the, the light driven plants that become food for cows and pigs and chickens and other delicious things that allow us to live and, and enjoy life. It is light that, that really drives everything on the earth. So that even those strange creatures which live at the bottom of caves, and they live in complete darkness, they're still dependent upon the sunlight that they never see. It is something which is essential to life. And we know that God is the source of light. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, 
let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. As we already read in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. In John chapter 8, it takes place the day after the events we looked at last week in John chapter 7, when Jesus stood in the temple and he cried out, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. The very next morning, Jesus went back into the temple and he was teaching people in a courtyard of the temple. And while he was teaching, the Pharisees brought to him a woman who had been called in adultery. And they were, they were trying to trap him. To, to find something that they could accuse him of. But Jesus' response to them showed them their own guilt. And after the accusing Pharisees had drifted off in shame, Jesus turned to, back to the crowd that had watched all of these events. And he said to them, verse 12, Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus' statement, I am the light of the world. It is an incredible statement. It's a beautiful picture. But he's also making some remarkable claims. He is claiming and unmistakably claiming to be God. We know from 1 John, God is light. We go back into the Old Testament, Psalm 27, verse 1. David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Isaiah chapter 60, the prophet Isaiah tells of the eternal kingdom that is coming. And he tells of this glorious kingdom that there they will need no sun or moon because the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. Jesus, when he says, I am the light of the world, he was making a claim to be the God of the Old Testament. He was claiming to be that which really only God is and God can be. He was also claiming to be the promised Messiah. Isaiah 49, chapter, Isaiah 49 verse 6 says about the Messiah, that I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the, the earth. And doesn't that sound like I'm the light of the world? When the baby Jesus was taken into the temple for the very first time, an aged saint named Simeon took those words from Isaiah 49 and applied them to that little infant. He said that Jesus is the light to the Gentiles. Earlier, John the Baptist's father said that Jesus would give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And so when Jesus claimed to be the light of the world, he was claiming to be the promised Messiah, to be the one who would shine upon the Gentiles and shine upon those in darkness. He is saying, I am that Savior that everyone has been waiting for. And with this ver in this verse, though, Jesus makes remarkable claims and he makes remarkable promises. He says, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. And we're beginning to see a contrast. Jesus is light. Those who follow him are not in darkness. Implied is those who do not follow him are in darkness. And light and darkness are two things that really could not be more opposite. Light drives out darkness. The two do not coexist peacefully together. When light comes, darkness flees. And the, the New Testament repeatedly uses light to describe 
God, to describe His nature, His character, particularly His holiness. The New Testament repeatedly uses darkness to describe sin and separation from God. Let me give you a few examples. Ephesians chapter 4, the unsaved are described as those who follow the idolatry of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the blindness of their heart. The next chapter, Ephesians chapter 5, it describes the sinful habits of the unsaved as the unfruitful works of darkness. The New Testament, in fact, says that those who have never received Jesus as Savior are darkness. It doesn't just say they are in darkness, they are darkness, and also they are under the power of darkness. So those without Jesus are blinded by their sin. They live in perpetual darkness. They are never able to see the light because their minds are darkened. Their eyes are blinded. They walk in darkness. They are under the power and the tyranny of darkness. And they do the deeds of darkness. And the worst thing about this darkness is that it is the darkness of being without the knowledge of God. We, when we're trying to keep a secret for somebody, or we're talking about somebody that doesn't know something, we say they are in the dark. They don't know. We use that darkness as a picture of ignorance, and the Bible does exactly the same thing. It uses darkness as a picture of the ignorance of God, so that those in darkness do not know God. They do not know the truths of God. They do not know the gospel of God. They do not know the glory of God. They are in darkness. And if you look down to verse 24, Jesus gives a warning. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. This is the problem. We're talking about darkness and light. We're not just talking about a mere difference of illumination. We're not talking about whether you're a day person or a night person. Whether you like staying up late or getting up early, whether you prefer the full moon or the sunrise. We're talking about a spiritual condition. And the spiritual condition is that those who are in darkness are in their sins. And and darkness may seem pleasant for a time. It may be nice to turn off all the lights. It may may be one that you have to have all the lights gone before you can fall asleep. You want to just pitch black in your room or in your house so you can sleep well. It may be nice for a little bit. But we know that Physically and psychologically, there are major problems with living in complete darkness. The consequences of darkness have continued really pretty dire. Much more significantly, the consequences of living in spiritual darkness are tragic. If you die in your sins, you will spend eternity in darkness. So the prophet Isaiah said that those who are in darkness are under and in the shadow of death. That death looms over them like a towering wave ready to crush them. And this shadow of death, we're not just talking about the threat of the physical death. Though certainly for those that are in darkness, physical death holds a great terror but it's particularly the threat of the eternal death that will be suffered for those who die in their sin, those who die in darkness. They are under the threat of a much greater, unending darkness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, God is light, and in Him 
is no darkness at all. That's why we need to be rescued. That's why we need light. That is why without the light there is no life. Because light drives out darkness. If you die in your sins, if you do not believe Jesus, you will not enter heaven. Even if you could, you would not enjoy the presence of God. You would stand there in front of an all-consuming light and find it your destruction. Those who die in their sin, in fact, are driven from the presence of God because darkness cannot reside in the presence of dark or the presence of light. And without Jesus. We are in darkness. We are in, under darkness and are blinded against the light. And worse yet, because the light of God is a consuming light, it is a light that torments and destroys darkness. You remember when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the, the commandments? While he was up there, he asked God to see his face, asked just to, to see God. And God's response to Moses was that no man can see God's face and live. The light of God is that which destroys anything which is infected with the darkness of sin. 1 Timothy chapter 6 describes Jesus as the one who dwells in the light which no man can approach, whom no man hath seen nor can see. This glorious light of God is so magnificent, it will destroy any sinner who comes into his presence. And this is the problem. So that if you end your life in darkness, if you end your life in sin, you will not rejoice in the presence of God. You will not find the great longing of your heart. You will not be off in the happy hunting grounds or in the place of your dreams or in whatever, uh, whatever description of heaven that may come to your mind. It will not be this wonderful, delightful place. You will find instead that you are standing before an all-consuming light. And the only hope, the only option at that point is you will be eternally separated from that light. That's not a hope. I misspoke there. The only consequence, the only result is you must be driven out of the presence of that light. And right now, in this life, this is the time of mercy. This is the time in which God gives us opportunity to repent. This is the time when we have a chance to come to the light, to be delivered from the darkness. When this life is over, the opportunity is gone. The mercy is ended. And we will enjoy no more the goodness of God. We will be completely and utterly separated from God. And I don't know if we can really get our minds around what that means. Because nobody is absolutely separated from the mercy and goodness of God on this earth. Right now, everyone receives various benefits from the goodness of God. We know this from the Gospel of Matthew. God causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, the rain to fall on the righteous and the wicked alike. We go to the book of the Psalms, and it tells us there that it is God that get, causes crops to grow in their due season to, give heart, to bring forth the harvest that men might rejoice. Right now, even those who say, I hate God, I don't believe there's a God, those who, who feel themselves to have nothing to do with God are still under the beneficence of God. 
Yet there's not yet an utter separation from him. But tragically, all those who die in their sin will be eternally separated from God. They will suffer that eternal separation in the darkness of hell, in the torment of nothing but wrath. Nothing but the divine judgment being poured out upon them. And this is where the gospel comes in. Because Jesus steps into the dark world and shines forth as a light to all of the world. Matthew chapter 4 says, The people which sat in darkness saw a great light. That is who Jesus is. He is this great light that brings illumination and life to the world so that Jesus is the true light, the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. John chapter 3 says that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. When Jesus came into the world, the world rejected him. They did not receive him. Even though the very ones that he came to, the Jews that he was born among, that he lived among, that he taught, they were the ones who were supposed to be waiting for him. Yet they rejected him. But despite the hatred of darkness for light, Jesus brings light to the world. And he promises in John 8 verse 12 that those who follow him will be brought out of darkness and into light. And he is making this promise as the one who is light and as the creator of light. He is able to bring you out of darkness because he is the one who caused light to form in the darkness. He is the one that, that not just is the source of it, the author of it, he is light. And because that is what he is, he gives light and life to all who follow him. He is the light that brings life to the world. A question, a question that every person must address, must wrestle with, honestly with themselves, is have you been taken out of darkness have you been brought into the light? How is that possible? The biblical answer is simple. You must believe. You must believe Jesus is the light. Jesus said in John chapter 12, while you have light, believe in the light that you might be the children of light. He says, I am come into the world that whosoever believeth on me it should not abide in darkness. There's the solution. The problem is darkness, the destruction, the condemnation, and the misery that goes with it. The solution is Jesus. He is the light. And we respond to that by believing Him. Jesus says, and incredibly promises, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. That's the solution to the problem, but I've actually not yet shown us the full severity of our problem. Because it's not just that we are in darkness, it's that we are also blinded. So those without Jesus cannot even see that they cannot see. Without Christ, we are like those creepy little salamanders that live deep in caves. They live their whole lives in complete darkness. But even if light were to come to them, they would see nothing because they are completely blind. That is the tragedy of the darkness of sin, is that we are in darkness and we are blinded. Both by the darkness, we are also blinded by Satan. 
Second Corinthians chapter 4 tells us that he is, he is working to keep your eyes covered, to keep you blinded, lest the light, the glorious light of the gospel of Christ should shine unto them. So we are in darkness, we are blind, we have an enemy agent actively working to keep us blinded, and tragically, many of us, many of the lost, willfully blind themselves. They close their eyes and they cover their faces so they cannot see the truth. They do everything to keep from seeing their sin, to keep from seeing their need. They do everything possible to convince themselves that Jesus is not real, that Jesus is not God, that they don't need a Savior. They, they are willfully ignorant of the truths of God and the truths of their own, of their own sinful condition. And the solution to this is still the same. It's still Jesus. Jesus is the one that not only gives light in darkness, He's also the one who opens the blinded eyes. Next week we're going to look in John 9. It's one of my favorite stories in the Gospel of John. and involves a blind man who God gives sight to. Jesus opens His eyes so that He can see. The solution to our darkness and our blindness is still the same. It is Jesus. And when Jesus is preached, when the Gospel is proclaimed, it peels back the scales from our eyes. It is the Gospel that pierces through the darkness, pierces deep into the heart and the soul. It is the Gospel that reveals to the blind their sin and the Savior. And if you have heard the Gospel and have not believed it, don't resist its illumination anymore. Turn to it. Believe Jesus. Believe Jesus is God. He is the light. He is the creator of all things. Believe Jesus is God who became man to save people. Believe Jesus is the only one who can save you. As he says in John 8, follow him. Turn from whatever it is you were following before. Whatever means of salvation you thought or whatever ever thoughts about salvation that you thought. Turn from all of that and follow Him. Believe Him to be the Savior that you so desperately need. Believe Him to be your full salvation. And if you will follow Him... He will give you light and life. And Christians, you who have followed Jesus, and you who are following Him, take note of Him. Pay attention to Him. Think of what He has done for you. Think of the illumination of your own soul. Think of the darkness that you were in before your salvation. Think of how He worked through His Word and His Spirit to open your eyes, to bring you to life, to work in you so that you would see Him. Consider Jesus. Consider His magnificence, His glory. Consider His brilliance. And even though He in all of His majesty is that which no man can behold, His glory is that which would consume sinful man, yet in His humility He shrouded that brilliance in the flesh of men so that He could be and was a man and rescue us from the tyranny of darkness. See Him who by His death has brought you out of the kingdom of darkness so that you can be translated into the kingdom of Christ. See Him who has made you the children of God, children of light, no longer in darkness. And praise Him. See Him and rejoice in Him because He is your light and your life.